ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ತ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಇಸ್ ದಿ ಸೋರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ಇನ್ಕಾರ್ನೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಟೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಒನ್ ಸೂತ ಉಚ ಜಗೃಹೇ ಪೌರುಷಂ ರೂಪಂ ಭಗವಾನ್ ಮಹದಾದಿ ಸಂಭೂತ ಷೋಡಶಕಲ ಆದೌ ಲೋಕಸಿ ಸೃಕ್ಷೆಯ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ಲೇಷನ್ ಸುತ ಸೆಟ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಬಿಗಿನಿಂಗ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಕ್ರಿಯೇಷನ್ ದ ಲೋಡ್ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ಯಾಂಡೆಡ್ ಹಿಮ್ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಲ್ ಫಾರ್ಮ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಪುರುಷ ಇನ್ಕಾರ್ನೇಷನ್ and manifested all the ingredients for the material creation and thus at first there was the creation of the 16 principles of material action this was for the purpose of creating the material universes next to yasyam vasishaya nasya yoga nidram vitanvataha as a part of the purusha lies down within the water of the universe from the navel lake of his body sprouts a lotus stem and from the lotus flower atop this stem brahma the master of all engineers in the universe becomes manifest text 3 It is believed that all the universal planetary systems are situated on the extensive body of the Purusha, but he has nothing to do with the created material ingredients His body is eternally in spiritual existence, our excellence. Text 4. Pashyantya do rupa madabra chakshusha Sahasra padoru bujana nadbutam Sahasra murda shravana kshinasikam Sahasra maulyambara kundalo lasat The devotees with their perfect eyes see the transcendental form of the purusha who has thousands of legs thighs arms and faces all extraordinary in that body there are thousands of heads ears eyes and noses they are decorated with thousands of helmets and glowing earrings and are adorned with garlands text 5 This form, the second manifestation of the Purusha, is the source and indestructible seed of multifarious incarnations within the universe. from the particles and portions of this form different living entities like demigods men and others are created text 6 sa eva pratamam devaha kaumaram sargam ashritaha chachara duscharam brahma brahmacharyam akanditam First of all in the beginning of creation there were the four unmarried sons of Brahma the Kumaras who being situated in a vow of celibacy underwent severe austerities for realization of the absolute truth text 7 dvitiyam tu bhavayasya rasatalagatam mahim uddarishyannu padatta the supreme enjoyer of all sacrifices accepted the incarnation of a bull the second incarnation and for the welfare of the earth he lifted the earth from the nether regions of the universe text 8 
तृतीय ऋषि सर्गम वै देवर्षि मुपेत्य सह तंत्र सात्वतमाचष्ट नैष्कर्म्यम कर्मण यत The personality of Godhead accepted the third empowered incarnation in the form of Deva Rishi Narada, who is a great sage among the demigods. He collected expositions of the Vedas, which deal with devotional service and which inspire non-fruitive action. Text nine. Durye Dharma Kala Sarge Nara Nara Yena Rishi. The twin sons of the wife of King Dharma. Thus he undertook severe and exemplary penances to control the senses. Text 10. Pancha Mahkapilo Nama Siddeshah the fifth incarnation, named Lord Kapila, is foremost among perfected beings. He gave an exposition of the creative elements and metaphysics to Asuri Brahmana, for in course of time this knowledge had been lost. Text 11. Shashtam atrera patyatvam vrutah prapto nasuyaya anvikshiki malarkaya prahlada divya uchivan. The sixth incarnation of the Purusha was the son of the sage Atri. He was born from the womb of Ansuya, who prayed for an incarnation. He spoke on the subject of transcendence. To Alaka, Pralada, and others, Yadu, Hayaya, etc. Text 12. Tataha Saptama Akutyam, Rucher Yegno Bhyajayata, Sayamadhyay Suraganyay, Apatvayam Bhuvantaram. The seventh incarnation was Yagna, the son of Prajapati Ruchi and his wife Akuti. He controlled the period during the change of Swayambhavua Manu and was assisted by demigods such as his son Yama. Text 13. Ashta me meru devyam tu na ber jata urukramaha darshayan vartmadiranam sarvashramanamaskrutam. The eighth incarnation was King Rishabha, son of King Nabi, and his wife Meru Devi. In this incarnation, the Lord showed the path of perfection, which is followed by those who have fully controlled their senses and who are honored by all orders of life. Text 14. Rushi Birya Chito Beje Navamam Parti Vambapuhu. O Brahmanas, in the ninth incarnation, the Lord prayed for five sages, accepted the body of King Prithu, who cultivated the land to yield various produce, and for that reason the earth was beautiful and attractive. Text 15. Rupam sajagruhe matsyam chakshushodadi samplave navya ropya mahi maya apadvai vasvatam manum. When there was a complete inundation after the period of the chakshusha manu and the whole world was deep within water, the Lord accepted the form of a fish and protected. Vaibhas Vatamanu, keeping him on a boat. Text 16. Sura Sura Namudadim, Matnatam Mandarachalam, Dadre Kamataru Pena, Prushtaye Kadashe Vibhu. 
The 11th incarnation of the Lord took the form of a tortoise, whose shell served as a pivot for the Mandara Chala hill, which was being used as a churning rod by the feast and atheists of the universe. Text 17. Dan Vantaram Dwadashamam Trayodashamame Vacha Apaya Yetsura Nanya Mohinya Mohayan Striya. In the twelfth incarnation, the Lord appeared as Danvantri, and in the thirteenth, he allured the atheist by the charming beauty of a woman and gave nectar to the demigods to drink. Text 18. Chatur dasham nara simham vibradvaitiendra murjitam dadara karajay rurav yerakam katakrudyata. In the 14th incarnation, the Lord appeared at Narsimha and bifurcated the strong body of the atheist Hiranyaka Shippu with his nails, just as a carpenter pierces cane. Text 19. Pancha dasham vamanakam krutvagada advarambale padatrayam yachamanaha pratyaditsustri pishtapam. In the 15th incarnation, the Lord assumed the form of a dwarf brahmana and visited the arena of sacrifice arranged by Maharaj Bali. Although at heart he was willing to regain the kingdom of the three planetary systems, he simply asked for a donation of three steps of land. Text 20. Avatare shodashame pashyan brahmadruhon rupan trisaptakrutva kopito in the 16th incarnation of the Godhead, the Lord as Brigupati annihilated the administrative class Kshetriyas 21 times, being angry with them because of the rebellion against the Brahmanas, the intelligent class. Text 21. Tataha Sapta Dashe Jataha Satyavatyam parasharat chakre vedataro shaka drushtva pum solpa meda saha. Thereafter, in the 17th incarnation of the <coughs> Vyasadeva appeared in the womb of Satyavati through Parashara Muni, and he divided the one Veda into several branches and sub branches seeing that the people in general were less intelligent. Text 22. Naradeva Tvama Pannaha Surakarya Chikirshaya Samudra Nigraha Dini Chakre Viryanya Tahparam In the 18th incarnation, the Lord appeared as King Rama in order to perform some pleasing work for the demigods, he exhibited superhuman powers by controlling the Indian Ocean and then killing the atheist king Ravana, who was on the other side of the sea. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, thank you very much. Gita Mataji, your Sanskrit pronunciation is amazing. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you, you Harsha Mataji. Thank you. Okay, give me one minute and I will try and share my screen. Okay, so you all can see my screen, I assume? Yes, Mataji, we can okay. see. Thank you very much. So today we will um, read the uh, verse 16. So Canto 1, chapter 3, verse 16. Before we recite the verse from the Bhagavatam, I mean, this is also from the Bhagavatam. We'll just say these prayers and then we'll move on to our verse for the day. 
नारायणम नमस्कृत नरम चरोतम देवीं सरस्वती व्यास तथो जय मुदी Before reciting the Shrimad Bhagavatam, which is the very means of conquest, one should offer respectful obeisances unto the personality of Godhead Narayana, unto Nar Narayan Rishi, the supermost human being, unto Mother Saraswati, the goddess of learning, and unto Sri Lavyasa Dev, the author. Okay, so today's verse. After Gita Mataji, I feel humble to recite this because I'm sure I will not be as good as her. But I will try. Sura Sura na muda dim, matna ta mandara chalam, dadre kamata rupe na, prista eka deshe vibhu. Translation and purport by Shila Propa, Shila Propa the ki jai. Translation: The eleventh incarnation of the Lord took the form of a tortoise. who shall served as a pivot for the mandarachal hill which was being used as a turning road by the theist and atheist of the universe purport i'll just read it because it is really small once both the atheist and the theist were engaged in producing nectar from the sea so that all of them could become deathless by drinking it at that time the mandarachal hill was used as as the churning road and the shell of lord tortoise the incarnation of godhead became the resting place the pivot of the hill in the sea water okay we'll recite some prayers and then we'll discuss this verse om agyanati mirandasya gyananjana gyananjana shakaya shrina tasmay shri guruve namaha श्री कृष्णा चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधार श्रीवासदी गौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्ण हरे 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 राम हरे राम राम हरे हरे ओम विष्णु पदाय कृष्ण प्रदाय श्रीमते भक्तिवृंद नमस्ते सरस्वती निर्विशेषा शून्यवादी पश्चतादेशतारिणे ओके सो अम as you can see we are continuing to discuss the various incarnations of uh, krishna and today we are on the 11th incarnation which is the tortoise incarnation so um i'm sure a lot of you will know the story why and how the lord incarnated as the tortoise but um if somebody doesn't know and also to you know refresh ourselves because whenever we hear of these past times of the lord and stories about his incarnation it purifies us so it is good to always read about it but before i move on to the story uh prabhupad in his um in his one of his classes on this uh, verse he went into a quite a detailed explanation about who are the suras and who are the asuras so suras he explained are the demigods or the theist they believe in god and the opposite of sura is asura asura are the demons they don't believe in the existence of god they live in this idea that they themselves are god and they do not wish to uh be subservient or surrender to the lord so you will understand the reason why prabhupada is going into this explanation once we listen to the story so remind me that you know we have to understand this reason but why suras and asuras okay so here once what happened was the story goes that once um king indra was on his uh elephant his very beautiful massive you know elephant airavat and so uh, durvasa muni was walking down the road and he saw the king of the demigods and when he saw the king of the demigods 
you know, he took a garland of marigolds to him and he offered it to King Indra. But King Indra was so puffed up, he was so proud of himself that he took the garland, but rather than accepting it, he gave it to his elephant. So he passed it on to the trunk of the elephant. And sorry, sorry I'm just going to mute. I request you all to mute yourself so that there is no disturbance during class. Thank you. So um, what um, Indra did was he just gave the garland to his elephant. And the elephant being an animal does not understand the meaning or the value of these things. It just crushed the garland. Seeing this, and we all, most of us know that Durvasa Muni is somebody who gets angry very easily. So seeing this, how he was in a way insulted, um, he cursed uh, King Indra and he said that, you know, you are so arrogant, very soon you will lose all your opulence. So this was his curse. Soon after this incident, soon after this incident, the um, demons actually attacked the demigods. And because that this curse was acting on um, Indra, the demigods suffered huge losses. And it came to such a state where they were about to lose everything that they had. And at that time then, you know, when, they, when the demigods have no other resource to any help that they can get, they then go to Lord Vishnu. So they went to the Lord and they requested him. They told him what their condition was and they, they requested him for help. And at that time, Lord Vishnu said that, unfortunately, at the moment, the demons are much more powerful than you and you cannot do anything. So at the moment, the best thing to do is try and work with them together. So the, the demigods took this advice of Vishnu and King Indra went to King Bali, who was the king of the Asuras. And he had a proposition for him. He spoke to him and he told him that what we should do is we should try and get the nectar from the bottom of the ocean. And we all can have it. And that way we all will become deathless. So death will not be able to come on us. We will become immortal. And Bali Maharaj liked this proposal because obviously the Asuras also wanted to be powerful, immortal, not have any issues in their physical body and the, and the gods. So they thought, okay, let us work together. Obviously, you know, Bali Maharaj must have thought that I don't need to share the nectar with them. I can take all for myself. These thoughts obviously were uh, going on. So what they did is uh, with a lot of effort, both, both the parties, the demons and the demigods, got this mountain, this, you know, uh, Mandarachal mountain, and placed it um, in the ocean. Now, here again, Prabhupada explains that, have any of you ever seen or have you ever churned milk? So you can see here this lady in the picture. In olden times, you know, people used to churn milk. In villages, even till a few years back, I think even 10, 20 years back, people would churn milk to make butter, you know, like that. But imagine this is a pot where you're churning milk. And here, the entire ocean is becoming... Yeah, a yeah. Sorry, there's some sound. Okay. So here, the entire ocean is becoming a pot. Can you imagine that? Now, what happens is for the non-believers to actually accept that something like this is happening is difficult because they don't see Krishna as God, right? Because they think, you know, that um, these, these activities cannot happen. How can you churn an entire ocean? As you can see in the picture on the right, these demons and demigods are standing in the ocean. The water is coming almost to their knees and waist. Most of us who have ever been to the sea or the ocean, we'll experience that as soon as we go into the water and the water comes to our knees or higher, we will start losing our balance. As Prabhupada says, we will be in difficulty. But here, you know, they are they're churning the ocean. So it is very difficult for non-believers or atheists to understand these concepts. 
So anyway, so the Mandara mountain has been got, you know, they place this um, uh, in, the, in the bed of the ocean. Then they go and request this giant serpent Vasuki to become like the thread, the rope that they have to tie around the mountain. And the demons decide to hold on the head side of the snake and the demigods hold the tail. So here you can see that Vasuki is used as a rope which has been tied around the mountain. And then they try to churn the ocean. So they do it once, two, three, four times. But then the mountains, mountain slips and goes down right to the bottom of the ocean to the mud and settles down there. Because you need like a pivot, as Prabhupada has explained in the translation, you need a pivot which will hold it and where by using that you can kind of churn. So at that time, both the demigods and the demons were frustrated because they were putting so much effort, but it was not working. And then Lord Krishna, he incarnated himself as the tortoise. And if any of you have heard the Dashavtar Stotra, where uh, this beautiful verse is actually talking about the uh, Kurmavtar. And it says, um, I'll read the English translation. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I've got something stuck on my uh, slides. I can't see it. All right, so it says, O Keshava, O Lord of the universe, O Lord Hari, who have assumed the form of a tortoise, all glories to you. In this incarnation as a divine tortoise, the great Mandara mountain rests upon your gigantic back as a pivot for churning the ocean of milk. And for some reason, I can't see the rest of it. I'm just going to try. Hold on one second. No. Ah, okay. Um, so it's I it's for my my screen is acting a bit funny, so I can't see it. So I'm missing some words. But it says that the mountain is like a large scar, like depression is put in your back, which has become most glorious. Now, Prabhupada explains that whenever there is whenever the Lord incarnates, there is a reason why he incarnates as a particular uh, entity. So he gives the example that Lord Ram incarnated because he had to uh, get rid of Ravana. So like that, there is a reason. Now here the Lord incarnated as a tortoise because the tortoise is an entity which can live either in the water or in the land also. So both places. So you see, there was a reason why the Lord incarnated as a tortoise, because it was able to fulfill the purpose that it was, you know, incarnating for. So sometimes people are not able to accept these things. Again, Prabhupada is explaining that uh, a lot of people are not able to accept that uh, Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead because they see him in the human form. When he comes in Vrindavan as a child, they see him as a human for a baby with you know two hands and two legs in the same form as us. And so they find it difficult to accept that Lord Krishna is the Supreme Personality. But the Lord is unlimited. There is no limit that you can put on him. The Lord can do what he wishes, which is why if he wants, when he wants, he incarnates as a boar, as a fish, as a tortoise, as Narsingadev, half lion and half man. So he can incarnate as whatever form he wishes to have or whatever form is actually needed. So anyways, um, the story continues, but this is, this is why the Lord incarnated as a tortoise. And then the story continues that, you know, the churning of the ocean takes place and eventually first, First poison, um, we'll go back to this picture so you can see. Uh, initially, uh, poison comes out from there and Lord Shiva is requested to have the poison because you know nobody else could have actually done that. And then Lord Shiva has, has the poison, but we won't go into all the details of the story. Eventually, the pot of nectar comes out from the churning of the ocean. 
And then the story continues. It's not the story. The pastime continues that uh, the demons being conniving, you know, they want the entire pot of nectar for themselves and they do take it. But again, Lord uh, Vishnu comes to the rescue of the demigods. And finally, the demigods do get the nectar. Now, somebody may, may think here that the demons work equally hard for the nectar as hard as the demigods. But they did not get anything. The entire pot of nectar was given to the demigods uh, by the Lord in his incarnation as Moini Murti. So I won't go into that detail because another speaker will cover that. But the explanation is or the understanding is that at every moment, the demigods take shelter of the Lord. They surrender to the Lord. Whenever there is any difficulty, they surrender to the Lord. Whereas the demons don't. And although in the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord says that I am not partial to anybody, but obviously somebody who is thinking of me all the time or is my devotee, I do think of them as well. So like that, that is why the pot of nectar was given um, to the demigods eventually. So this is the pastime of how the Lord incarnated as Kurmadev. But the problem is, like I've been discussing, that somehow because of our limited uh, intelligence, limited senses, we are not able to understand the Lord at all. Prabhupada says that, yes, the atheists do not want to know that there is a God. The theists do understand there is God, but they cannot know Krishna fully. And thus... There is this verse in the Chaitanya Charitamrit, which, uh, which is a beautiful verse. It comes in other places in the Shastras. It says, Ata Shri Krishna Namadi Na Bhavet Raham Indriya Sevan Mukhe Hi Jeevadu Svayam Evas Puradiyata. The translation is, material senses cannot appreciate Krishna's holy name, form, qualities and pastimes. When a conditioned soul is awakened to Krishna consciousness and renders service by using his tongue to chant the Lord's holy name and taste the remnants of the Lord's food, the tongue is purified and one gradually comes to understand who Krishna really is. So again and again and again in all our scriptures, the importance of using our tongue to chant the holy name is always, always, always spoken about. And so many times on this forum, we have discussed that in this Kali Yuga, there is no other way of realizing or understanding the Lord besides chanting the holy name. And of course, we have to do what we have to do, but without the mercy of the Lord, unless he reveals himself, we will not understand who Krishna is. That is a fact. But Prabhupada says that for us in our present condition, with our material senses, we will not be able to understand anything. And thus, what we have to try and do is, um, like it is said, Chetodarpana Marjanam, that when the mirror is covered with dust, and you look in the mirror, you will not be able to see your reflection because the mirror is covered. However, if you clean the mirror with a cloth, wipe it clean, immediately you can see your reflection. Right now in our current material condition, we are carrying the samskaras or the memories or you know, the, the karma of so many, 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 many lifetimes. And the only way that we can clean this mirror of our heart, of our mind <clears throat> in this yug is by chanting the Lord's holy name. And like it says over here, by having the remnants of the Lord's food. When Prabhupada started this Krishna conscious movement, these are the two things that he really focused on. Whoever of you have read the Lilamrit or have read you know, um, anecdotes and stories about um, past disciples of Srila Prabhupada, the only two things that he really focused on was uh, constantly chanting the holy name and 
whatever way possible distribution of prashad because like it says in this verse it says that if you can render service by doing these two things then the tongue is purified and then one gradually comes to understand who krishna really is and then a very important thing that when i was doing research which i found really really interesting was that how even mahaprabhu displayed the same aspect of a tortoise so uh, the chapter is in chaitanya charitamrit uh, antya leela 17th chapter and the chapter is entitled the bodily transformations of mahaprabhu in that actually in the summary it says shila bhakti vinod thakur gives the following summary of the 17th chapter and in that he says that um just the last line i will read mahaprabhu remained unconscious assuming the aspect of a tortoise so what the 17th ch- chapter actually describes is uh mahaprabhu is with sarvabhauma bhattacharya and with ramananda rai and the three of them are constantly discussing the past times of krishna and while they are having these discussions uh, sarvabhauma bhattacharya also sings various songs relating to the past times and ramananda rai recites verses from the scriptures from different books written by um, other vaishnava acharyas and that way uh, mahaprabhu ramananda rai and sarvabhauma are absorbed in the past times of um, uh, krishna so later on mahaprabhu gets really ecstatic but uh, sarvabhauma you know gets into his bed and he sings songs and he calms him down and mahaprabhu falls asleep but what happens is um while asleep he listens or he hears the flute of krishna being played and as soon as he hears the flute the sound of the flute of krishna again he develops these ecstatic symptoms like a gopi and he gets up from his bed and he walks out he wanders away although his servant govinda was around but and and the doors were actually closed and locked but he still manages to go out and when govinda wakes up and sees that you know mahaprabhu is missing he goes and asks ramananda rai and sarvabhauma to look for him so these two associates go looking for him they find him in in a cow shed fallen down among some cows and then the verse is here which says the translation says his arms and legs entered the trunk of his body exactly like those of a tortoise his mouth was foaming there were eruptions on his body and tears flowed from his eyes um i'll just stop sharing and then we can dis- we can talk about this a bit more so yeah it's it shows over here how even mahaprabhu displayed this form of a tortoise and we all know that mahaprabhu is non different to krishna himself so he over here and i found this very very interesting that he also displayed this um, form of a tortoise so that was that i wanted to discuss and um, i think that's it really from this verse there is uh, nothing more in this verse except for you know how krishna incarnated as a tortoise and why very important because prabhupad very specifically makes this comment and he says that krishna incarnates in different forms for a specific reason so you know there's always a reason why he comes um and so we've seen why he has come as a tortoise so i'll stop here and if there are any comments or questions we've got time because this was a very small verse so very good the kumari very nice the narrated wonderfully always just so very, very encouraging palika mata ji no need really it's very nice i mean such a small part but buddy you put it together all nicely very nice presentation for us to understand it elaborately just a small question i've asked this before like you know indra the demigods they are mode of goodness that's why they are in the heavenly planet but the way sometimes indra um you know react to him and got so angry with the um uh, or yeah yeah money and how 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 does it happen 
I mean, demigods are supposed to be, you know, uh, giving us this knowledge of mode of goodness. So uh, what do we learn from there? And I mean, I know I'm just ignorant. I just want to. No, no, you are not ignorant, Parika Mataji. You ask these questions so that I can, I can think about it and purify myself. But first point, which I will pick up from your question itself, is that you're saying that the demigods in the, are in the mode of goodness. Yes, they are in the mode of goodness. But also we read in our scriptures that to achieve that point of pure devotion, you have to even transcend the mode of goodness. Mm -hmm. And I think the most important point that we should take from this or the lesson that we should learn from when we hear about these demigods is how even this mode of goodness is still the mo modes of material nature. So we are still in the material nature, although we might have gone, moved much further from the mode of ignorance and passion. And thus, we are still governed by the laws of the material nature mm. in that sense. So that's one thing. And the second thing, obviously, we know that, you know, all of these demigods and all these leelas that Krishna has with them is to teach us a lesson. It is not that these are all you know, obviously, these are all associates of the Lord, and they know much better. But they, it is all there to teach us lesson. And especially from, you know, Indra, we learn that we should not become proud or puffed up. But like I've heard uh, His Holiness Radhanath Maharaj say, if we didn't have a Hiranyakashapu, we wouldn't have Lord Narsingadev. That's true. So, so, you know, so these, these personalities or these characters are there because, you know, uh, the Lord has to incarnate and the Lord has to show, uh, you know, pastimes between his pure devotees and between, you know, these, these personalities. But we also know that Hiranyakashipu was actually, you know, initially in Vaikuntha. Mm -hmm. So um, these are just pastimes is what I understand. And in other way, you can look at it that even being in the mode of goodness does not completely ensure you there is still chances that a little bit of you know a little bit of uh, uh, how do you say uh, if you're not careful inattentiveness and you will fall down pride, pride comes out yeah thank you i, I was also now because we are now doing the you know um the all the you know how, how everything was creation this creation actually is i mean i have i had little i was listening to in the class in the morning also you know yeah. and the, actually it's a go he, he's just magnanimous krishna just absolutely wonderful i mean what he's not doing for us yes yes that is, that is so it's just, it is just so i i think this this whole canto is helping us to understand how grateful we need to be to yes. krishna. this whole universe how it was created and more we think, more it helps us to really, really understand that, you know, how little we are and how big yes. he is and how merciful he is. Okay. So actually, this is the reason that, you know, these cantos were written and for us to be more focused on understanding the whole creation and how we could be, you know, devoted to Krishna. And, and I, also, I also believe, I, uh, my feeling is that Srimad Bhagavatam is, you know, uh, it gives us all these pastimes that Krishna has performed with his devotees. And, and it's so wonderful to see his relation with each and every devotee, whether he's a friend or a husband or, a, or you know, or, or just a king or, or father. It's just that he has this relation, you know, and that is why we have to just understand this personal aspect of the Lord and we all can then, you know, have this kind of relation with the Lord. And that, I think, is really beautiful. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, I mean, like, like Shemudra Mantan, he doesn't have to be a pivot. I mean, like, if, you know, Demi got win, and he just wanted to help them to play their game. He yes. just came like that. You know? Yes. He turned, you know. Such yes. a, such a wonderful, merciful Lord. Thank you. Hare Krishna. There's a wonderful comment on the chat by Hema Mataji and Hema Mataji is so right that how uh, Mahaprabhu, you know, he retracts his limbs in Vipralamba Bhava and the same way when Jagannath Ji was listening to the story of Krishna's pastimes, how he retracted his limbs 
Actually, Krishna was listening and he retracted his limbs and became the form of Jagannath. That is a beautiful pastime. Thank you, Hema Mataji. Hare Krishna, Mataji. Hare Krishna. Thank you for your lovely explanations. Um, you know, Mahaprabhu, he showed such feelings of ecstasy throughout mm. his journey. Um, mm. <clears throat> is that, I am just assuming, is that because he was in the frame of mind of Radharani? Yes, that is right, Mataji. When he came, Mahaprabhu, when he came, he came <clears throat> in the mood of Radharani. Yes. So um, externally, it is said that Mahaprabhu came because he wanted to show how one can become a devotee of Krishna. But internally, also because he wanted to experience what Radharani feels for Krishna. And, and he wanted to feel that because he could not understand what is the kind of love that Radharani has. What is the kind of ecstasy that she feels for me? He wanted to experience that. So when he came as Mahaprabhu, he came in this, and that's why he, it says he came in this golden avatar in the, in the, in the, you know, the body color like Radharani and in the mood of Radharani. And that is why throughout he was showing these ecstatic symptoms, just like how Radharani would be, and especially in separation from Krishna. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions or corrections? Hare Krishna Mataji, don't know um, Just a, I, a observation, I may be wrong. It's been a long time since I read Telila uh, Chaitanya Charitamata, but I believe that uh, your reference to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in tortoise form is is that is not that he displayed a form of a tortoise it was just a description is that he, he his limbs Correct. were affected like a tortoise so it's not that he showed a tortoise no, form. No, no, no. Uh, it's more that he was in Jagannath Pao, uh, which is why his limbs were retracted so just a slight uh, no that's uh, yeah in in the that's why in the verse that I um, that I recited from the Chaitanya Charitamrita, that's exactly what Krishna das Kaviraj is saying that he retracted his limbs, but just like a tortoise. So the reference is made that he also like a tortoise. So, you know, the reference could be any other, but it was specifically said that just like a tortoise. So not like they were saying that he became Kurma Avatar or whatever, but just like a tortoise, he also retracted his limbs. So yes, you're right. That's Sorry, right. apologies for interrupting. No, 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 that's right. You're right. Absolutely correct. Any other comments? Hare Krishna, Mataji. Yes, Namrata Mataji. Uh, Mataji, thank you so much for a wonderful class as always. Very clear. So thank you, Mataji. Uh, Mataji, I, I have actually a separate question, if I, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, so Mataji, I've been reading this 10 minutes a day Bhagavad Gita to my kids. They're at the age of 12 and 13, where mm -hmm. the teenage age, you know, argument and all of that. So like questioning back, why, etc., etc. So um, Yesterday I was reading 10 minutes to them and uh, we came to, we're still on the introduction because they're fixed on 10 minutes. I can't go even 11 minutes, but I'm like, okay, well, 10 minutes it itself is good enough for me for now. Yeah. So uh, Mataji, after 20, maybe let's say after 10 days, suddenly my daughter asked me a question, which means first time I felt that she's hearing yeah. because she asked me a question. Yeah. So she said to me, Oh, why does it say we don't have uh, birth and death? So I explained her about the soul concept. Then she goes to me, okay, so you're telling me that Krishna created our soul. Yes. Mm -hmm. So who created Krishna? It, it's the questions were so sudden. So I said, well, Krishna doesn't need creation. You know, Krishna is Krishna. He's the creator of the world. Mm -hmm. And he's just, she's just looking at me. Would, would I have explained it a bit more differently, Mataji? That Krishna doesn't need creation because he is the God itself. See, actually, for a 12 and 13 year old, you couldn't have gone more deeper. I mean, what you said was correct. Only thing it could have been said in, in, in a slightly different way in the sense that children, you know, sometimes like, let's say when they look at trees, you know, they don't think that that tree is coming from a seed. For them, the tree is there. It's just there. Right. So yes. they 
think about the birth of the tree or that at some point you know it was a seed and then it has grown and because it's just it's such a huge tree so for them it's just it's just there so likewise you know if you give the analogy or or like the ocean where did the ocean come from where did all this water come from did somebody actually fill buckets of water and go and put it in the ocean so just some simple analogy so that then they can relate to it so like that how the ocean is just there you can't really put a date and say in the year so and so the ocean came into being or this particular tree came you know like that for i'm i'm talking about for that young age you know that way then you you should you can say that you know like that we cannot really say that you know uh, krishna because krishna has existed forever maybe that um, will also kind of add to their so they will be able to kind of do a comparison that oh okay like that you know yep i now understood mata ji thank you hari krishna hari krishna any other questions hari krishna no? mata ji sorry yes uh, thanks for the class uh, just quick question mata ji you said that uh, when durvasa muni curse demigod uh, king indra he was on his eravat elephant Mm-hmm. but after that churning of the ocean happened mm-hmm. the power came from churning of the ocean only that's my understanding oh is it as far as i am aware from the churning of the ocean other things did come out but i don't because i know dhanvantrai came and then poison came and before that other yeah. i have not read in my research about eravat coming from the churning of the ocean Mataji, I have also heard that yes, Airava did arrive. So, but okay. I've heard so. I'm not sure. Okay, so I'll have to do research because on my research, what I have read is that he was on his. Let me just read this. Uh, yeah, Indra was on the back of his white elephant. So maybe no, but he has only white. White elephant is Airava, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the story that I have read. so maybe i'll we'll have to do i'll i'll have to do a bit more research on that okay no problem mata ji hare krishna thank you thank you for your question uh, okay there's a question can you please tell us a little more about kurma avatar like what more uh, preeti mata ji i'm not really sure what more would you want to know if you could be more like specific about what you would like to know i can try and answer okay um i just want i've never heard all heard of this avatar so i just re- really briefly if you just explain in a couple of so, lines so preeti mata ji the thing is what we are reading now this chapter third chapter of the first canto describes the many different avatars and um what propat says is the avatars of krishna are like waves of the ocean so many keep coming so it's not like you know they there's only one or two or 10 but the dasha avatars these are the 10 most famous or well known avatars of krishna so like we have the matsya avatar the kurma avatar narsingha dev you know vaman dev like that we have 10 well known avatars of krishna and out of that kurma or the tortoise avatar is one and like it is explained that these avatars don't just come they come with a specific purpose each one of them comes with a specific purpose right like the boar avatar of krishna had come because the entire world had fallen into the depths of the ocean and the boar came and picked up this universe on its tusk and brought it out of the of the ocean again so every avatar comes for a specific reason and the kurma avatar came so that um, he could the kurma dev became the pivot where they where the demons and the demigods could then churn the ocean in order to get the nectar out like that so um this is this is actually in brief about kurma avatar i think in canto 11 if i'm not mistaken there's a bit more but to be honest the main reference is just this then there isn't a lot more about the kurma avatar this is the main story and this is what actually this is the past time of kurma avatar um as far as i have read a uh, little bit there may be more which i'm not really aware of okay. so thank you no problem 
Okay, so I think we can stop here. Thank you all for joining. One chakal patri ubis chakapa sindhu. We can put it on a pavane Hare Krishna. Shila Prabhupada teacher. Thank you. Wonderful class. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Mataji. Very nice class.